and he's turned his attention to um, my favorite inkling. Um, Warney Lewis um, produced seven volumes of French cultural history dealing with the age of Louis XIV. Um, his, his books went into paperback editions. They went into multiple paperback editions. Um, my cousin is a, is a French scholar and professor at the University of the South. And I asked him, George, does, have you ever heard of uh, W.H. Lewis? And he says, oh, the, the um, historian of, of uh, Louis XIV. And I said, yeah, that's the one. He said, yes, it, it's, his, his work is still highly regarded. And so here's someone who had a, a, a career independent of his brother that we haven't really known a lot about. But Don's going to change all that. And this morning, he's going to introduce you to the major, Don King. When I ask my students at the beginning of uh, a course that I teach, 20th Century British Literature, when I ask them the question, what's the most important historical event that's occurred in the last 100, 100 years, uh, as you might imagine, they don't go back very far. For some of them, 9-11, of course, is a very important event. A few might remember the explosion of one of, the, of America's spaceships in the 80s. And then every once in a while, someone will go back to the dropping of the atomic bomb. But uh, I give them a chance to talk about them. And then I challenge them, in fact, I challenge them through the rest of the semester, to reconsider that the most important historical event, at least in the West, in the last 100 years, was the Great War, World War I. And I don't have time to go into that this morning, but I think today all of us are still reeling, whether we know it or not, from the effects of World War I. Warren Lewis, as did many of the Inklings, he experienced firsthand uh, the global collapse of Victorian and Edwardian culture. And as he served on the battlefield during the World War I, World War I he certainly saw the most extreme cases of the human image being discarded. He has a lot to share with us this morning. Now, most of the presentations that um, we've had this week, with few exceptions, have been what I would call macro presentations, large-scale surveys of things. So today, uh, I'm going to apologize. This is going to be very much a micro-scale look at one of the Inklings, and it's um, Warren Lewis during World War I. The mind-numbing butchery of World War I is without equal in the history of warfare, so grotesque that it borders on being an outrage to the imagination. Estimates place the number killed on the battlefield at 8,750,000, including, as Michael mentioned yesterday, 750,000 British soldiers, with another 21 million individuals wounded or diseased. I mean, think about that for a minute. 30 million people directly affected by World War I. Even those of us brought up on World War II, Vietnam, and the Gulf Wars, wars with their own particular nightmares of death, recoil at this incredible loss of life and the seemingly absurd battlefield tactics. As Paul Fussell puts it in The Great War in Modern Memory, every war is ironic because every war is worse than expected. And that is certainly true of World War I. Warren thought the war would be over by Christmas. Started August 4th, 1914, he thought it would be over by Christmas. It went on for another four years. But if what Fussell says is true, then World War I suggests it is one of history's greatest ironies. After more than four years of service in their shared nightmare of the Great War, Warren Lewis recounts the memorable day on December 27th, 1918, that he and his brother, C.S. Lewis, were finally united. And so this is uh, from his diary. A red letter day today. We, he and his father Albert, 
We're sitting in the study in about 11 o'clock this morning when we saw a cab coming up the avenue. It was Jack's. He's been demobilized, thank God. Needless to say, there were great doings. He is looking quite fit. We had lunch and then all three went for a walk. It was as if the dream of four years had passed away and we were still in the year 1950. <clears throat> Although a good deal has been written about C.S. Lewis and his wartime service, much less has been written about Warren's involvement in World War I. We know the basic outline of Warren's military service during the Great War, including the dates of his various postings, the record of the, of the divisions that he served with, and the dates of his several promotions. However, this outline does not really address important matters related to his service. For instance, what branch of the British Army did he serve in? What were his everyday duties as an officer? What were his ambitions for promotion? How did his attitude toward the war change? When was he under active fire and how did he respond? How did he react to his brother's decision to fight? And what were his fears once his brother was directly involved in battlefield action? Perhaps most importantly, what were the most important things he took away from service during World War, during the Great War, the things that he carried with him for the rest of his life? Fortunately, we have two critical primary sources available that can help, help answer some of these questions. The extensive letters that Warren wrote to his father Albert and Albert's replies, as well as an extensive diary that, Lewis, that Warren Lewis kept from January 1, <coughs> December 1918, January 1, December 18, 1918, to December, through December 1918. In light of these two resources, as well as Warren's service records and other related war writings, this morning I'm going to attempt to answer some of the questions I've posed, all with a view of trying to offer a more comprehensive view of Warren's life and service during World War One, and I should, should say that this is this is an excerpt from the second chapter of the biography that I'm working on um, on on Warren Lewis. You've got the basic facts of Warren's service record in front of you with those bullets there, so I won't read through those, but you might want to refer back to them. So I'll pick it up with um, when Warren first goes over on October the second, nineteen fourteen, from the base depot in France. Warren writes his first letter to his father after being commissioned as a second lieutenant. Warren writes, Here am I, second lieutenant W.H. Lewis of the Army Service Corps, sitting in the anteroom after mess, writing you an epistle. Doesn't it seem too good to be true? Thank you very much for the wires you sent me, but especially for the one, uh, for the one of congratulations. I am very, very glad to have received, uh, to have relieved you to a large extent of the anxiety for the future by my getting into the ASC. Although at a time like this, it was a bit of a wrench to put down for it instead of one of the fighting wars. Although Warren in this letter expresses some misgivings about not having sought to fight or, or to serve in a fighting unit, his delight with the situation overcomes any second thoughts. Like thousands of other subalterns, and the subaltern was a junior officer below the rank of captain, Warren was excited finally to be on the field. What was the Army Service for? In brief, the ASC was responsible for keeping the British Army supplied with its provisions. Hundreds of tons of equipment, ammunition, and food had to be loaded, moved, unloaded, and distributed every day to keep the men at the front fed and armed. The Army Service Corps were responsible for keeping the horses and the lorries on the road as they carried supplies from bases along the French coast to the front line. Among other things, it was responsible for land, coastal and lake transport, air dispatch, barracks administration, the Army Fire Service, staff and headquarters units, supply of food, water, fuel, and domestic materials such as clothing, furniture, and stationery, and the supply of technical and military equipment. I'm just tired reading all of those um, <laughs> responsibilities. Here's the insignia of the ASC, and a couple of other shots here. Bravo, the commos. Um, by the way, C. 
some of the men serving on the front lines accused the men serving in the ASC as being jam stealers. In fact, that was sort of their nickname. <laughs> Another shot in the ASC jingle. If you're short of ammunition or of grub, you're wanting more. The boys you're looking out for are the army service. <laughs> and here is an example of the kind of, uh, just one example of the kind of material that they had to move. So you can see at the beginning of the war, they moved 842,000 gallons of gasoline. By the end of the war, they were moving 13 million gallons. So just an incredible amount of work that had to be done. Like other new recruits, Warren spent his initial training at the La Havre Base Depot and then transferred to the Advanced Depot at Luan for posting. During his training, Warren received instruction in and I think this is somewhat comical, horse riding, driving, drills and general duties in addition to passing through the prescribed courses. And they underwent practical courses of instruction in the farriers, wheelers, and saddlers' shops. <coughs> it may surprise some that part of Warren's Initial training included horse riding and related skills. However, the ASC was organized into four sections, horse transport, mechanical transport, supply, and remount. Warren's posting to the 4th Company 7th Divisional Train on November 4, 1914, was to a horse transport division. This means he had to have some level of knowledge and expertise regarding horses. I think the comedy was uh, C.S. Lewis and his father talking about Warren riding a horse. Over 53,000 riding and draft horses were used with the British Expeditionary Force by the time Warren reached France. And here are a couple of posters that give um, some insight into that. I think most of us don't think of World War I as being a war where horses were involved, but they certainly were. Really not until the last year of the war was there much mechanized uh, movement in terms of the land movement, certainly there was railroad. Now such a large number of animals meant that a good time, a good deal of time, money, and effort went into the caring for them. Warren gives us some idea of this when he recounts a typical daily routine in a letter to his father. He writes, the weather here is desperately cold and wet, a very serious thing for horses which are in the open. However, we have only lost one through pneumonia in the last 10 days. The captain and myself have managed to get our charges stabled in a ruined cottage where they are very comfortable. We patched up the roof and managed to find enough straw to bend them down every night. We are now putting up elaborate horse lines in the field for the company of horses. And here are a couple of more shots of, again, horses being loaded on the barges and so forth. Here are horses pulling a wagon. Uh, this is an odd kind of picture, but not only did the men wear gas masks, rather primitive ones, so did the horses. I don't think these gas masks were very effective, by all accounts. Before examining more closely Warren's initial field experience with the ASC, it's important to note a consistent caution given him by his father, excessive use of alcohol. This is Albert Wright. I don't want to preach, Warney, but there's another thing I've got to say, not only as a father to a dear son, but as one good friend to another. The Army is a profession of pitfalls. You must know something of them. Perhaps you've already seen the broken and ruined bodies of what might have been good men lying in them. I've already spoken to you of the dangers of drink, and you've given me a promise. Recollect that it's the beginning of these things that have to be avoided. There are two simple truths that one should always remember. Drink is stronger than the strongest man, and once you begin, it's hard to stop. A month later, Albert repeats this warning after receiving a letter from Warren in which Warren boasts about having sat along a boulevard cafe drinking gin and smoking French cigarettes. Albert writes, sitting on the boulevard smoking cigarettes and drinking gin is a very great stunt, but 
an old chum may give a young man a word of advice. Have little or nothing to do with Jim. For a young man, it is not only unnecessary, it is absolutely injurious. It prevents him from doing his best by the reaction afterward, either mentally or physically. And in addition, there's a horrible risk. It's so easy to contract the habit. And if it grips a man, the consequence is damnation in this world and the next. Gambling may ruin a man's estate, and he may recover. Women may ruin a man's health, and he, broken with disease, may die in penitence and self-reproach. But drink is the most dangerous and most enslaving of all the vices. Now, notwithstanding Albert's warnings, as most of us know, Warren eventually became an alcoholic. Were these early warnings unintended catalysts of Warren's illness, or did Albert see early on that his son was constitutionally prone to an excessive use of alcohol? I can't answer those questions. I hope to answer some of them by the time I finish writing about Warren. In addition to Warren's daily duties with his fourth transport unit, what else were the responsibilities of the second lieutenant in the ASC? And I think this, is, this may either be on your handout or um, it'll show up here eventually. According to the 1911 Regimental Standing Orders of the ASC, a subaltern such as Warren would command half a company. They will make themselves thoroughly acquainted with the qualifications of the men under their command. They are responsible to the commanding officer for the efficiency of their half companies and will instruct all non-commissioned officers serving under their orders in their respective duties. Now, since a company normally consisted of 200 men, this means Warren would have had roughly 100 men under his training and command. Some of the general duties of a subaltern including opening all official letters addressed to them or arranging for another officer to open official letters in case of unavoidable absence. Moreover, subalterns would publish all policies affecting the pay, service, and documents of all warrant officers, non-commissioned officers, and men under their command, as well as making recommendations for good conduct badges. He would have also assisted in the prescribed courses for training of recruits in a force transport company. This training would take place over 14 weeks and included physical training, foot drills, marksmanship, barracks duties, proper dress, semaphore signaling, care of equipment, practical horsemanship, including saddling and fastening up and pack saddlery and harnessing, pitching and striking tents, horse welfare and disease, stable routine, and, and private, improvising repairs. And here are a couple of more shots of some of the, uh, some examples of the heavy use of horses and Warren's inevitable involvement with them. Now, that's an, I, I'm calling that an armed war horse. <laughs> I don't think it would stand up very long against a machine gun in place. So not only was there a incredible loss of life of human beings during World War I, and it, it is obvious it was an incredible loss of horses. Like many other soldiers, Warren contracted influenza and was eventually admitted to the hospital. While there, he healed quickly and enjoyed his time away from active duty. However, he did see things in the hospital exposing him to some of the horrors of war that he had heretofore no way of understanding. He writes his father on October 4, 1950, that, quote, Some of the wounded are ghastly sights. The most pitiful sight I have come across was a gunner who came to our hospital. He was absolutely uninjured physically, but he's playing about on the floor of his room like a little child, and his intelligence is of that of about a five-year-old. God knows what he saw to drive him into that state of mind. I'm sorry to have missed the big attack. I do hope it's been a success. Certainly the casualties have been very heavy. As the war dragged on, Warren's feelings towards Germany, not surprisingly, turned rather bitter. In one letter, he took writes his father, I hold that the German nation has forfeited all right to be treated as a civilized nation. I don't mean to suggest that they should be massacred, but why shouldn't the country be divided between Russia, France, and England? Does that sound familiar? 
40 years old, then planted with settlers who would get such preferential treatment that the natives would be forced to immigrate or live in poverty. And of course, for any able-bodied native to be found in possession of arms would be a capital offense. Surely, after 200 years of that, the German menace would be at an end. Warren has little sympathy for able-bodied men back home looking for ways to avoid serving in the army. He also begins to refer to his brother frequently in his letters. Um, and by the way, C.S. Lewis's nickname within the family was It. <laughs> so this, this will explain his reference here in his letter. Talking about It, I had a letter from him yesterday. Do brothers and sisters do that kind of thing? <laughs> he seems to be getting on all right. So, well, I think it will be great if he manages to pull off that scholarship and he's studying with Kirkpatrick at this time. So I've already noted weather is a frequent topic. Warren underscoring how difficult the battlefield conditions were. The weather out here is desperate just at present. It snows during the day and freezes at night. We have the greatest difficulty in getting the wagons along the roads at all. The country is hilly and horses can get no grip at all. However, we are well off compared with those unfortunate ones in the trenches. It must be something awful up there just now. In another letter to his father, Warren shares about a recent camp move where he had found a good billet for the horses and the men, the NCOs, and the officers. He writes, In the last place, I had rats in my bedroom. They used to wait until I dozed off and then climbed up the bed curtains and dropped on my pillow. The result was that I didn't get much sleep. Of all the minor horrors of active, active service, I think rats are the worst. Don't you hate the things? In a later letter, Warren responds to Albert's increasing worries about his younger son and his eventual involvement in the war. Warren writes, As to what you say about it, my earnest advice is to keep him with Kirk for another year. He would never make a good soldier, and is much better out of Increasingly, letters to his fathers highlight the almost apocalyptic conditions of the battlefield. And this next excerpt I'm reading you is written two weeks after the beginning of the Battle of the Somme. And the Somme began on July the 1st, 1916, um, and was just a horrific experience. So this is Warren writing about it. This was written July 16th, 1916. I was hoping the timing would be 100 years to the day when I could read this excerpt to you, but it's quite okay. Close. I went up today and saw the ground over which desperate fighting had been taking place for the last week. Do you remember the biblical phrase, the abomination of desolation? I never realized before what it meant. In a strip of ground, perhaps three miles broad, there's no living thing, not a blade of grass, not a tree, not a building which stands more than three feet high. One cannot walk over it without difficulty. For there are no two square yards which do not contain a shell hole. And all around are men who look as if they were asleep, and things that once were men. There was one particularly vivid picture, which I shall never be able to forget. A boy asleep on a bank, and the mess by his head was his brain. On October 1, 1916, Warren learned that he had been promoted to temporary captain. However, it was not without a downside. He thought he would take over command of his former company, the 4th Company 7th Divisional Train, but instead he was assigned to the 32nd Divisional Train and found himself serving under, quote, a robber of a major. He writes to his father, The major won't let me do any work, and he won't let me leave the camp. My duty consists in following you 18 inches behind him around the camp all day long and saying, Yes, sir, and no, sir, and ha-ha, sir. <laughs> when he makes a joke. He potters around all day and talks intermittently. He is the most infernal bore I've ever met in my life. Warren is so disillusioned that he longs to be back in his old company as a second lieutenant. Moreover, this letter also reveals Warren's growing and discomforting realization that his brother is going to have to serve in the war. Yet just a few weeks later, he's more upbeat in part because he learns his brother has won the scholarship to Oxford but even more so because he had been made a temporary supply officer 
a job with a good deal of logistic responsibility. His assumption of more responsibility coincides with the Allied advances on the battlefield. From February 23rd to April 5th, 1917, the German armies, employing a scorched earth policy, withdrew to the Hindenburg Line in order to take up a defensive position intended to hold back the forward momentum of the Allied armies. Warren offers a detailed assessment of this withdrawal in a letter to his father of April 5th, 1917. I'm very sorry to have left you so long without any news, but, it's for the, but it is for the best of all possible reasons. We have been moving continuously and moving forward. After nearly two and a half years, we have got to the real business. I don't think I'm giving anything away when I tell you that we're at least 10 miles over the original German front line. Of course, you will have seen from the papers in what manner the chivalry in Germany has conducted its retreat. But unless you saw it for yourself, you would get no idea what it really means. Every house has been burned down. Every fruit tree cut down. The roads mined. In the villages, the crockery was collected and smashed, and even the children's toys. All the wells were poisoned. Here and there, one finds houses intact, especially the bigger ones. But as several of these blew up after being occupied for a few days, in other words, they were mine, they are in great disfavor just at present. Now, three weeks after this letter, Warren learns that his brother is matriculated at University College Oxford, and that his brother immediately enjoyed immediately joined the officers' training corps at Keeble College. As the Allies advanced, Warren found himself increasingly exposed to artillery fire. On June 8, 1917, he tells his father, The first night we got there, I had just settled down in bed when there was a whiz, bang. I sat up to listen, then a second one came and threw mud and stones on my tent. We took the hint and got out of bed got all the horses away, and spent the night in the fields about two miles away. They had only just returned to camp several hours later when the shelling began again, and they had to make another hasty retreat. The Major and I made a bolt for it across the cart track, but halfway out it got so hot that we had to drop into the ditch. It was just as well we did, for the next shell burst just 12 yards from us. We stayed in the ditch for 40 minutes while the Bosch hated with fury in 5.9 inch shells. Albert must have been alarmed reading this letter, especially when Warren adds with grim humor at the end, I'm bringing you home a piece of the shell as a souvenir. I dug it out of a tree, and the reason I keep it is if it had been three inches more left and one lower, there would be a promising young captain missing in the ASC. Over the next six months, Warren continues his duties with the second, 32nd Divisional Train and worries about his brother. Good news came when he was finally promoted to full captain on November the 29th, 1917. His promotion set the stage for a major change in his military career, a move from the horse transport section to the mechanical transport section of the ASC, something that he had applied for in March of 1917. Only three days after his promotion, he writes his father, not having been born and bred with horses, I could never make a living out of them. Now take the military transport. In 22-year time, I will retire with a pension. I would then be about 40, a youngish man still. Supposing I had a thorough knowledge of commercial motors, I would probably be able to get some civil job to augment my position instead of decaying in some boarding house. Now, I can't imagine Warren Lewis as a used car salesman, but I guess at least we thought about that as a possibility. <laughs> he also tries to, uh, excuse me, he, he also responds to news, Albert's news, his father's news, that his brothers decided to stay in the infantry. If you know anything about Lewis, C.S. Lewis's service in the war, um, Albert did everything he could to get him out of an infantry division, but C.S. Lewis would have nothing to do with it. So here's Albert um, trying to, here's a, excuse me, Warren trying to comfort Albert. I can set your mind at rest that it is not at all probable that Jacks will be in the front line, or even in the forward area, for some time. This, I may add, is not an attempt to be conciliatory, but a straight statement of opinion. I am, so, I am not so down in the mouth about Jacks as you are. We have a saying out here that if your name is written on a German shell or bullet, it will get you wherever you are, so why worry? Do cheer up, Happy. I'm convinced that nothing is going to happen to Jacks. Continuous or contiguous with these persistent concerns about his brother, Warren reported to the Mechanical Transport School of Instruction at St. Omer 
where he underwent training from December 23rd, 1917 to March 4th, 1918. The need for an immense period, period of training was acute since his duties as a captain of a mechanical transport company would include overseeing the company workshop, all repairs and equipment. His transfer to the mechanical transport company meant his skills had to be completely retooled. For the next 10 weeks, Warren learned about steam vehicles. Yes, they actually used steam vehicles during World War I. They moved at about three miles an hour. <laughs> so he had learned all aspects of steam engines, all aspects of internal combustion engines, clutches, gears, gears box, and so forth. He just had to learn everything about combustion, uh, excuse me, internal combustion engines and the vehicles and their parts. Here's a shot of some of the drivers. While his time at the Mechanical Transport School of Instruction is not without some difficulties, for the most part, Warren welcomes the new challenge. As the weeks pass, he, stud he studies hard, takes and passes written tests, and drives all kinds of vehicles. He also begins to take apart various parts of trucks and motorcycles, learning on each occasion detailed information about them. Now, I'm just going to pause here for a minute because I've been thinking about this a lot. Could C.S. Lewis have ever done this? I'm not sure C.S. Lewis knew the end, uh, the two different ends of a screwdriver. <laughs> so somebody help me here. If you're left brain dominant, is that the analytical? Yeah. Okay. So if we could, you know, done to get it backwards. Is left side left side's analytical, right side's intuitive? Help me out here. Yes, sir. Okay. So if there was some way to make a composite of C.S. Lewis and his brother, I think Warren was the left brain and his brother was the right brain. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to play with that idea a little bit. I don't know if it'll go anywhere or not. However, it wasn't all work as several diaries refer to um, eating in a local restaurant, Kitty's, where he notices several beautiful women. When he writes his father about his new posting, he's especially upbeat. And his diary reflects his relative happiness during his training. He writes on January the 28th, 1918, and we're only about 10 months from the end of the war. Of course, I didn't know that then. But he writes in his diary, a lovely sunny day with just enough bite in the air to keep one moving. One of those days when it is good to be alive. I'm halfway through my course. In his summary of his first month of training, he writes in his diary, the first thing that strikes me on reading over the first month of my diary is the frequent reference to being bored. Yet when I come to think of it, I've really had a good time. The work has been interesting and I'm being shaken out of the groove in which I must admit I was beginning to decay. But the sooner I'm off this course, the better. One spends too much money, has too many little drinks. In spite of the fact that I'm working pretty hard, I find the life an unhealthy one. Albert writes Warren in February of 1918 and expresses deep, deep discouragement about the progress of the war, certain that it would never end. And he continues to worry obsessively about his younger son. In order to allay his father's depression, Warren writes him on February 9th, 1918 and says, I wish as happy that I, can, that I could convince you that your depression is almost entirely due to your solitary and lonely life. Jax is very seldom absent from my thought now, but still I'm for some reason convinced that all will be well with him. In addition, he offers a somewhat brighter view of the war. He uses a poker metaphor, telling his father that most soldiers in the field believe that the Germans are about to put all their money into the pot via a major offensive. Even though the Germans hold some powerful cards, Warren assures Albert that their hand is not as good as the Allies. He writes, The universal opinion out here is that the Hun will stake everything on a large-scale offensive before America can weigh in. And that is what everyone is hoping for. Uh, some historians are going to have to help me out here, but I, I think America has committed to coming to the fight in 1917, but I don't think any of their troops actually showed up until 1918. Before America can weigh in, and that is what everyone is hoping for. Then when he has done his damnness, even the docile Hans and Fritz will begin to realize that Um Kaiser is not all that he claims to be. It's a pity you never played poker, or you would appreciate the situation better. The Bosch hold a fairish hand, but not so good as ours. Unfortunately for him, however, he's so badly dipped that he cannot afford to pay up and drop it. Therefore, he's naturally bluffing all he can in hopes of frightening us out, which I may remark is a very dangerous game. Unless I've lost all my common sense, that's the plain interpretation of the present state of affairs. 
So do all you can. Cheer up and don't be called out on a bluff. And we will soon all be together at home again. Warren finished his training at the Mechanic Transport School of Instruction and reported the D Siege Park and Ammunition Column of the Royal Garrison Artillery on March the 7th, 1918. He shipped out by train, noting the desolate landscape. I was very interested to notice the changes in all the Psalm country, where no one could hardly move for troops when I was last here. Now there's hardly a soul. The old no man's land is still as it was, cut to pieces and desolate. His duties as captain of the company included distributing pay to the men, authorizing leave, and censoring mail. One disconcerting side of his serving with the ammunition column was that he was under more regular enemy fire. After one attack, he writes, got caught under an archie barrage. Chunks came down in all directions. Most unpleasant while it lasted, especially as I had forgotten my tin hat as, I, as usual. He also was aware that the Germans were preparing a major offensive, and on March 21, 1918, he notes the limited success of the offensive. Was witnesses from his diary. Was wakened at 5 a.m. by heavy fire. At 5.10 a.m., four 5.9 shells arrived sufficiently close to be unpleasant. Misty morning. A lot of shrapnel and high explosives all around, but not too near us. Very uneasy morning. At 11 a.m., news came through that the Bosch had broken through to a depth of three miles. For the next eight days, Warner's company are, on, um, are under almost constant fire, including machine gun fire, and end up falling back a number of times in order to avoid being overrun. He reports better news in his diary about a week later. News this morning is quite cheerful, although the Germans have succeeded in smashing up the Fifth Army front. Still, they are being more or less held. In his diary summary of that month, March 1918, Warren confesses how honestly he's near to breaking and being, how they are near to being broken and overrun. And the Allies were um, in the face of the German offensive. He writes, this has been a most eventful month. On the 4th, I ceased to interest myself in notes and le lectures and found myself a fully-fledged MT officer. Then I was only beginning to feel settled up the line when the retreat started. For about 24 hours, I went through agonies. I really thought the unspeakable thing had happened, that the army was broken. I never realized before how much it all meant to me. Now, however, I think that thanks to God we are safe again, but it's been a bad fright. If only Jacks were safe, I should be quite happy. A more constant theme in his diary at this time is the amount of time he spends censoring the mail of the men in his company who are writing home. For some in Warren's position, this became a very tiresome obligation, especially dealing with the inordinate number of love letters being sent back home. One officer, one ASC officer, not in Warren's company, he came up with a novel solution. He writes, It became a part of my duties to censor all the letters the men wrote home, and this censoring became a very serious business for me, as I frequently had to night, at night had to wade through carefully 150 love letters. So I bought a football, a soccer ball. So I bought a football, which I took back from my men to play with. The result was quite marvelous. <laughs> the men took it to it so keenly that they played football all day and had very little time left in which to write love letters. <laughs> Soon, I never had more than five love letters to censor it. <laughs> Warren's letters and diary entries for April 1918 are somewhat contradictory. On the one hand, he sounds optimistic about the Allies repelling the, repelling the German offensive when he writes his father. On the other hand, his diary entries are not so rosy. In his diary, for instance, he writes, News this morning pretty bad. The German attack up north continues. Most depressing day I remember for a long time. Hope something will turn up to stop him soon. In one letter, Warren praises the bravery of the infantry and wonders what everyone back home thinks of the progress of the war. He writes, Everyone here is quite confident, although no one attempts to deny that the Germans have put up a fine fight and had quite a good run for their money. He predicts the war will be over in three or four months. He's pretty close, by the way. With his only real worry having to do with his brother. He writes, Jax is never out of my thoughts now. Yet in his diary entry for April 15th, he writes, There's no news of the war, but all sorts of rumors floating about. I endeavor to forget about Jax. Over the next week, the news about the war is better, and Warren is less anxious. However, on April 24th, he received a telegraph from his father saying that Jack was in hospital, severely wounded. 
more and it says, gave me a devilish bad fright. He borrows a motorcycle and rides the 50 miles in just over three hours, finding that Jack was only slightly wounded and in great form, expecting to be sent back home. Warren writes, thank God he's out of it for a bit. And in fact, um, C.S. Lewis never goes back to the battlefield. In his diary summary for April 19, uh, 1918, he begins by referring to his brother. A month, in which might, a month which might have been better, but certainly could have been worse. From a selfish point of view, the great news was undoubtedly Jack's wound. It will be a very long time before I forget that ride and waiting in the hospital hall to see him. As to the war, if things have been serious during the month, there's been nothing to compare with the days that which followed the 21st of March. The chief sorrow about the fighting up north is the loss of several towns in which after three years, we knew so many people that we regarded them as homes away from home. But after all, if it will shorten the war, no one must grumble. Warren's letters and diary of May 1918 are more cheery, reflecting the gradual realization that the forces of war are turning against the enemy and toward the Allies. Entries in his diary of the light and the beauty of the weather, his learning and enjoying how to play badminton. It's kind of a curious thing to be doing on the battlefield, but you had to do something. Rides on his motorcycle, visiting pretty women, uh, lively dinner parties, and so on. He delights to learn that his brother has now been transferred to hospital in London, safe in the battlefield. He writes, heard from home today, Jax is safe in London. Thank God. And by the way, as a footnote, in one long letter, Albert writes to Warren and explains why he never went to visit um, his son. And, and basically, it was he just felt like he could not leave, that his job was so important that he could not leave. But he also, Albert also knew that that sort of created an inevitable chasm between the two of them. It's an interesting uh, thing to pick up on. Um, at the beginning of June 1918 marks the beginning of the end for the, the German army. Although four, separate, uh, although four separate battles in the spring offensive led to some territorial advances against the Allies, the German successes were marked by heavy losses and a weakened supply line. And eventually, as many of you know, on November the 11th, 1918, the armistice was signed, effectively ending war, uh, the Great War. On the 11th month, on the 11th day, at the 11th hour. Several years ago, I was here researching the Bodmin on November the 11th. And about two minutes before the hour of 11 o'clock, the person conducting uh, or overseeing the room rang a bell. And he said, in two minutes, we're going to have a moment of silence for all of the men, for all of the men and women who died, not only in World War I and all of our wars, but in particular in World War I. For one, the last five months of the war were relatively quiet. His letters and diary recount days of routine work, augmented by his purchase of a typewriter. That's the same instrument he would later use to type out the complete 11 volume history of the Lewis family. I, I, I haven't verified this fact now, but if you go to the kilns, as I understand it, the only original artifact in the house is Warren's typewriter. He cites, he cites on a number of uh, occasions when he serves on boards of court marshals and discusses with his father's uh, sort of routine matters having to do with business and so forth. And I'm going to, I'm going to let you hear what he writes in his diary on the day before the armistice was signed. He writes this, A day which I shall never forget in a hurry. Things were much as usual in the morning and afternoon. I was in the office at about 8 p.m. and suddenly there was an outburst of sirens and rockets and weary lights, searchlights and all sorts of other things. Hurried back to the mess and found everyone dancing in the room. Everyone had drinks and we all went up on the town. Everyone off their heads, cars with people sitting all over them. Australians firing, firing pistols in the square. There were about six bonfires going with Belgians dancing and starting around them with our lads. Cathedral and church bells pealed most of the night. Got home into bed at about 2.30 a.m. A very great day indeed. So ends the war. The next day he adds to his diary, It seems wonderful to think that the war is really over at last. Thanks God, Jax has come through safely, and that nightmare is now lifted from my mind. Among many topics regarding Warren's World War service that I don't have time to talk about this morning are his periods of leave, almost always home to Ireland, his deep and abiding love of classical music, his keeping up with family news, his careful attention to business and investment concerns, oftentimes the letters between Albert and Warren, or Albert saying, or Warren saying, please invest my money in whatever. Um, 
His discussion of the service of dozens of ships, and many of these ships Warren would have seen having been constructed when he was a little boy. His regular, term, uh, his regular attendance at ar an army church services, and his detailed analysis of the sermons that he heard, <laughs> the many novels and plays and other books that he read, and his growing fascination with French history, later manifested as Hal mentioned in seven books that he wrote. There are three final observations I want to make in finishing up here this morning. And the first one is that Warren grew up during the Great War. As a schoolboy at Malvern College, and then as a cadet at Sandhurst, and I haven't been able to talk about the idea of those things this morning, Warren lived a sheltered, protected, and privileged life. He had no real knowledge of the way of the world. And despite the early death of his mother, he had never faced the reality of life outside the very comfortable life his father provided him and his brother. Of course, the brutality of World War I was something he couldn't close his eyes to. But as important as that was that for the first time in his life, he rubbed shoulders with men not in his class. Appointed a second lieutenant not long after his 19th birthday, he knew nothing about leading men and learned how to do so primarily by the examples he saw among the senior officers so he served under both positive and negative examples. By the end of the war, he was a captain responsible for overseeing equipment, camps, and 200 men and officers. So he really did grow up. Second, the many allusions to drinking, sometimes seemingly benign, do not mask the fact that he engaged in heavy episodes of drinking. This fact in itself is not surprising, given the alternating periods he experienced of long, monotonous boredom and intense, frightening peril. Most soldiers had to find a way to cope with their service and their fear, so Warren's drinking would have not been an anomaly, but rather an everyday fact of life. Notwithstanding his father's early warnings against excessive drinking, Warren's use of alcohol became an unfortunate theme later in his life. By today's standards, and I'm certainly no expert on this, but I think by today's standards, Warren's almost, almost certainly became an alcoholic because of the pattern of drinking he acquired during World War I and then later throughout his Army career. He retired from the Army in 1932. Third and most importantly, Warren's life as a writer was provoked, enhanced, and stimulated by his wartime service. While as many letters to his father might have been expected, after all, what could be more comforting than to try to connect regularly to life back home, where lay familiarity, warm memories of hearth and home, beloved places and people, tender scenes of friendship, and above all, normality, Warren's diaries were more than a coping mechanism. When we consider his complete diary, by the way, he kept a regular diary until just a year or so before he died in 1973. The complete diary runs to 1.25 million words. I believe his diaries became a place within which he could explore not only the simple everyday chronicle of his life, and there are long passages that aren't that interesting to read, I can assure you. Um, he also, in many places, explores deeper existential questions and matters common to all human beings. Who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going? Moreover, Warren's diaries reflect keenly upon the people he lived and served with during the war, and later in life he does the same with those he lived and worked with, most notably the odd collection of people who lived with him and his brother at the Kilns, especially Mrs. Moore, as early as this week I shared with you some of his observations. The wartime diaries and letters also included extensive character sketches of some of his commanders, comrades, and friends. In these character sketches, Warren shows a wonderful eye for physical description, but even more astute evaluations of the essential moral, spiritual, and social qualities of the individual under review. Here's one example, and this is his, this is his character sketch of one of his, one of his commanders. He was short and sturdily built, with a square head covered with gray hair, very closely cropped except in front, where one lock usually hung down over his forehead. His ruddy, weather-beaten face contained a blunt nose, a close, clipped little mustache, and a pair of very small gray eyes, partially concealed by lids, which were always half-closed. He spoke in a low, querulous monotone, surprisingly at variance with an appearance which seemed to call for a loud-voiced, preemptory self-assertiveness. He was never seen to open a book or even look at a newspaper. He never left camp unless compelled to do so in the course of duty. Whether he could ride or not, I do not know. 
Certainly he never mounted a horse while I was serving with him, not even on the line of march when he left me to conduct the company and took a lift in a car. One speedily realized that the man was a, man, a mass of hate. Hatred of almost everyone was to him the normal condition of existence, a banked up, smoldering hatred, always active, never flaring into temper, reasonless, and as intractable as the force of nature. If for any reason, or no reason, he took a dislike of the man, he was extraordinarily ingenious and painstaking at making his life a hell to him by a thousand carefully thought out vexations and inflictions. And by the way, this man liked Warren. <laughs> he was, in fact, the worst of all types, the nagging bully. He was an interminable talker of, this, of the disjointed stop and start again variety, and conversation, or rather his monologue, was generally of how men of his acquaintance had come to ruin and disgrace, told with a relish which was sickening. He gloated on the stories of British atrocities committed on Germans. He frequently lectured his men on Germany and the Germans in the style of an Old Testament prophet, finishing off with, the only good on is a dead on. In the course of a somewhat picaresque life, I have met a good many men of all classes and types. It raises my faith in human nature when I reflect that of all I've ever met, I can only recollect four whom I would describe as bad men. Ronald McClear is one of the four. In addition to character sketches, Warren's wartime writings often capture the irony of the whole affair. In one early letter he writes, Last night there was a glorious sunset, all crimson and gold, and not a gun to be heard anywhere. Somehow it st suddenly struck me how silly the whole thing is. I don't know if you can understand what I mean, but on a lovely, lovely spring evening, why should some five million men be concentrating all their energy on the destruction of another five million men? John Wayne himself, and a later inkling, had great affection for Warren, noting, among other qualities, his penchant for excellent writing. In writing about the published portions of Warren's diary entry, Wayne links the two brothers. This is John Wayne. I think C.S. Lewis is the best writer of expository prose that modern England has to show. He sets out his subject matter absolutely correctly, and his style is perfect from one sentence to the next. It's always rhythmical, cogent, economical, memorable. The words are right. The rhythms are right. The words are in their right order. The images are right. There's no clumsy sentence anywhere. It's absolutely superb prose. And then Wayne adds this. W.H. Lewis is exactly the same. In his less ambitious way, there's no clumsily written sentence anywhere in his work. He had the same gift. Warren Lewis's service in the nightmare called World War I was a central shaping influence on the rest of his life. He was a soldier, as I said before, until 1932. He became one of the original Inklings, and he became the author not only of the Lewis papers, but of those French historical pieces we mentioned before. His is a worthy legacy, one deserving to have its own story, as more than just the brother of C.S. Lewis. Thank you. They're all in the Lewis papers, the 11 volume type script that he, that, had, put that together. he had put together. And so there, he published all that. No, but he didn't, it wasn't published. It wasn't was published. It? it hasn't been published yet. This is just a type script. It's available. Um, Walter, Cowden, Walter Hooper has a copy. Wheaton College has a copy. And there's a copy on microfilm at the Pier Yeah. Yes. Did Warren Lewis ever have any romantic? <laughs> um, could, could you repeat it? Yes, the question is, did, did Warney have any ambitious, am, excuse me, any romantic ambitions? Um, well, I have a colleague, I have, I have a colleague who's working on correspondence that he had with a missionary towards the end of his life, but I don't think that that was very <coughs> romantic. And in the diaries and in the letters, he, he talked, you know, he mentions looking at beautiful women and seeing beautiful women, but... He doesn't, as far as I can tell, he never had a, a deep 
emotional attachment to a woman or a man or anyone else. I mean, his, his strongest emotional attachment was to his brother. No question about it. Was there any thought from the men on the front line uh, about the men serving in the Army Service Corps that they were trying to escape battle, or were they just looked at as evil troops? Well, of course, there were, there were some cases. I mean, as I said, their nickname were the Jam Stealers. But I think that was um, sort of an affectionate cut on the men serving the ASC. Um, many, many men serving the ASC were killed during battle because, I mean, they had to take the supplies up in the front line. They were, they were risking their lives as well. They weren't you know, in the trenches in the same way, but um, they, they were served in, in, in a longer piece. I've got several quotes from um, infantry soldiers who give great praise to the ASC. So. It would sort of be like the men and women serving today in, in the supply arm of the British Army or the American Army or whatever army. I mean, you've got to have those people. Thank you. Enjoy your break.